This video is gonna take you through the chapter two test review. So the test is gonna cover sections two, one to two, five. It will include graphing when we get there. I'll explain those questions, the format of those, and then the rest are either gonna be multiple choice or fill in the blank. So we start with two, one, which is the equations and graphs of lines. So the review of our y equals mx plus b, which is our slope intercept form, where the m is the slope, and the b, actually the zero comma b, is our y-intercept. Then we had point slope, which is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. This time x1, y1 is the point that we plug into, and m again is the slope. So those two we use interchangeably. If we're trying to find the equation of a line, we take those and the information and plug it into those equations and then solve. Standard form is something that it can ask you to get the equation into at the end. And that is ax plus by equals c, where they are all whole numbers, so no fractions or decimals. The x and y are on the same side and the x has to be positive. So if I had something in slope intercept form, I would rearrange it, I would get rid of any fractions or decimals and then rearrange it so that the x is positive, positive and the x and y are on the same side. Remember a shortcut to getting the slope here is negative a over b. So if I had something like 3x plus 4y equals 12, then the slope of that line would be negative three over positive four. So slope of our lines, there's four different kinds of slope. Positive, which is increasing as I move from left to right. Negative, which is decreasing as I move from left to right. Zero, which happens in a horizontal line. And undefined, which happens in a vertical line. Slope, variable is m. If I have two points, I find it doing y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's also known as rise over run. And for these special cases, the zero and undefined, our horizontal line is a y equals a number with no x. And the undefined is x equals a number with no y. Then we got to graphing. So if we didn't have it initially in slope intercept form, we would rearrange it so that it is in slope intercept form. We use the B to start on the Y axis. So if I had Y equals two thirds X minus one, I would start at negative one and I would go up two and to the right three, or I could reverse both of those directions down to and to the left three, depending on the graph I have, if it's easier to do it that way or not and then draw your line through those coordinates. And again, if it was, let's say it's an x equals negative two, I'm gonna go to negative two, plot a vertical line. And if it was y equals three, I'm gonna go to positive three and plot a horizontal line. Okay, also in this section was intercepts. So if I'm trying to find the intercept from an equation and I wanna find the x-intercept, uh, x-intercept, I'm gonna plug zero in for y. If I'm trying to find the y-intercept, I'm gonna plug zero in for x. So if I just used something like two x minus five y equals 12 and I want to find the x-intercept, I'm going to plug 0 in for y. I'd get 2x equals 12 and x equals 6, so it would be 6, 0. And if I want to find the y-intercept, I'm going to plug 0 in for x, negative 5y equals 12 and y equals negative 12 fifths, so it would be 0, negative 12 fifths. Then we talked about parallel and perpendicular lines. 
So remember that lines that are parallel have the same slope and lines that are perpendicular have opposite reciprocals. So if you change the sign, that's their opposites, and then flip your fraction, that's the reciprocal part. Okay, so let's work through some examples. Finding the equation given different types of information. If you're given point slope, remember you have two options. Plug it into slope intercept and then solve, plug back, solve for B and plug back in the B and the M or use uh, point slope. So this is a point and this is slope. I prefer using point slope. So we'll do one method that way and then we'll do the next um, example the other way. So this becomes my x1, y1. I would get y minus y1 equals mx minus x1. y minus a negative 3 becomes plus 3 equals 1 fourth x minus x1, which is 2. Distribute that 1 fourth. Negative 2 times 1 fourth becomes a negative 1 half. And then subtract the 3 y would equal 1 fourth x negative 1 half minus 3 is negative 1 half minus 6 halves which is negative 7 halves and then there's the equation of that line let's say now you're given two points so if you're given two points you first have to find the slope so i'm going to do x1 y1 x2 y2 1 minus a negative 3 becomes plus 3 over five minus two and I get four thirds. So there's the slope. And then you can pick either of those points. Because this second one, they're both positive and a lot of mistakes are made with, a, made with a positive and negatives, I would recommend that. So let's plug it into slope intercept this time. So I get plug it into y equals mx plus b. The y is one, the m is four thirds, the x is five. I get one equals 20 thirds plus B, and then subtract that 20 thirds from both sides. It's canceled from here. One becomes three over three minus 20 over three, and my B is negative 17 thirds. So then when I plug back in, I have to plug the B and I have to plug the M. I'd get y equals 4 thirds x minus 17 thirds. And there's your equation. Okay, what happens if you're given the x and y intercept? So although these are intercepts, they're really just points. You kind of have two choices here. Treat the x intercept as though it's negative 2, 0, because x means that the y is 0. And the y-intercept is though it's 0, 4. Or you can use the y-intercept as b and this coordinate point as your x, your y, and then solve for slope. So you can choose. You can either take these two points, find slope from them. So if I did that 4 minus 0 over 0 minus a negative 2, 4 halves. And that tells me my slope is m. And then I know this is b, and I get y equals 2x plus four. Or again, you could have used the one of the points that you could have used this as the X and the Y and this is your this is your B and solve for M and then plug back in the M and the B. So there's a couple different ways to do it. Okay, so now we're working through some examples where you're given the parallel and perpendicular. So if you are given that it's parallel to this line and passing through this point, I'm going to keep that point as my x, y. The only thing I need from this line is its slope. So remember, negative a over b is the shortcut when it's in standard form, which this is. So negative a, which is in front of the x, would be negative 2 over b is negative 3, and that's 2 thirds. There's your m, and then here's my point. I'm going to plug it into point slope y minus a negative 2 becomes plus 2 equals 2 thirds 
x minus 4, distribute the 2 thirds, subtract the 2, 2 thirds x, this becomes 6 thirds minus 14 thirds. The next one is perpendicular to that same line. So we already know the slope of this line is 2 thirds. Perpendicular would be negative 2 thirds. So here's my slope. Here's my point. This time I'm going to do slope intercept format. There's your x and your y. So negative 2 equals negative 2 thirds. x is 4 plus b. Negative 2 equals negative 8 thirds plus b. Add the 8 thirds. 6 thirds, which is what negative 2 would, or negative 6 thirds plus 8 thirds would be 2 thirds. That's your B. And then again, your slope, negative 2 thirds. So Y equals negative 2 thirds X plus 2 thirds. There's your equation that's perpendicular. And then this last thing says, take one of those equations, put it in a standard form. So let's just say we take this last one. Y equals negative 2 thirds X plus 2 thirds. For standard form, I have to get rid of my fraction. So I'm going to multiply everything by 3. And the X and Y have to be on the same side. The X has to be positive. So I'm going to move this X over here. 2X plus 3Y would equal 2. And that would be that equation in standard form. So just pay attention to the instructions. If it says slope intercept, we're looking at something like this. If it says standard form, then you want to get it into the form like that. Okay, that was a lot. That was all 2, 1. Then we got into 2, 2, which is our introduction into functions. So the beginning was super easy. This was just figuring out if something is a function. If I'm looking at points, the x cannot repeat with a different y. From an equation, the y cannot be raised to an even power or in absolute value. So I couldn't have y to the second or y to the fourth, and I couldn't have y in absolute value. From a graph, we use the vertical line test. So if a vertical line passes through a graph at more than one point, then it would fail the vertical line test. So think about something that's like the absolute value of y. This is actually going to be a v turned on its side. This fails your vertical line test. It obviously fails your equation test. And let's say this is point 1, 1, and 1, negative 1. That x, because this would be 1, 1, and this would be negative 1, 1, that same x, Sorry, 1, 1, and 1, negative 1. That same x would have two different y's. So it would also fail that first test. So all three of these should be consistent. If it fails one, it would fail all three. Okay, then we got into evaluating the function. So you were given an f of x and then an f of a value or an expression. So if I gave you that f of x equals x squared minus 3x plus 2, and I want you to find f of negative 2. Everywhere there's an x, I'm going to take and plug in a negative 2. So I get 4 plus 6 plus 2, or 10 plus 2, which is 12. And then came domain of a function from an equation. So algebraically figuring out these is what this is. So if I want to find the domain of an equation, it is all real numbers except if one of the three cases that follows happens. So all real numbers meaning negative infinity to positive infinity if it's an interval notation, except if there's a variable in the denominator, and for these we set the denominator not equal to zero, if there's a variable underneath the square root, and for these we set what's under the root greater than or equal to zero because it can't be negative otherwise you'd be square rooting a negative number and the last is the combination of those two the variable under the square root in the denominator and now we set what's underneath the root greater than zero because it could no longer equal zero so now let's look at a few examples 
f of x equals x squared plus 3x plus 1. None of the cases are happening here that would restrict our, do our domain. So this is all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity, or all real numbers. The second one is 1 over x squared minus 2x minus 3. So I've got a variable in the denominator. I would set that not equal to 0. This can be factored x minus 3, x plus 1. And then neither of those can equal 0. So x cannot equal 3 or negative 1. So all reals except negative 1 and 3. In interval notation, it would be negative infinity to negative 1, then negative 1 to 3, then 3 to positive infinity. So the test, these would be multiple choice questions, and you're looking at something like this for your algebraic. When we get to the graphing, you'll see you're going to enter it in a little bit differently. Next up is f of x equals the cube root of x. This is not a square root, so this actually has no restriction. This would be in all real numbers. Then we get to square root and something in the denominator. So the square root in the, denom in the numerator has to be greater than or equal to 0. 3x would have to be greater than or equal to negative 1. And x would have to be greater than or equal to negative 1 third. The denominator cannot equal 0, so x cannot equal 3. So if I put this on a number line, greater than or equal to 1 third would be a solid dot or a bracket pointing to the right there. Now, not equal to 3 means I have a hole at 3. So in interval notation, this is negative 1 third to 3 with a parentheses on 3, and then 3 to positive infinity. In words, this would be all real numbers greater than or equal to negative 1 third except now looking at the last one on this one, f of x equals the square root of x plus 4 over the square root of x minus 2. So my numerator has to be greater than or equal to 0. My denominator has to be greater than 0. So my numerator would be x is greater than or equal to negative 4. And my denominator would be x is greater than 2. So if I draw this on a number line, I've got negative 4 and 2 greater than or equal to negative 4 and greater than, which is a parenthesis, 2. This is an and because it can't be one or the other. It has to be both, which means I can only use where they overlap, which is going to be that positive 2 to positive infinity. So in interval notation, it's 2 to positive infinity. In, in words, it's all real numbers greater than 2. All right, so that wraps up 2, 2, which was the introduction into functions. Then we got into 2, 3, evaluating the graphs of functions. So this is where we did domain and range, increasing and decreasing, and constant behavior. Remember, domain goes left to right. These are the x values. The range goes bottom to top. And these are the y values. Increasing, decreasing, and constant is all read left to right using the x values. So increasing is it rises as it moves left to right. Decreasing falls as you move left to right. Constant is horizontal. So let's use these two graphs here to practice this. So let's, on this first example, this is, call this A, start with domain. So domain is all the values from left to right. It starts over here, which means it's technically got an arrow there. It would continue off the graph. It goes from left to right all the way to here. It stops, but then it picks up there, continues up here, stops, picks up here, and continues. In these places, there's one solid and one open dot, which means there's no stop to my graph, and same here. 
So my domain actually goes all the values from left to right or negative infinity to positive infinity. If it cuts off at the edge of the graph, you'd assume it's an arrow. Now the range goes bottom to top. So if I look at this again, I'm going to clean this off. The lowest value is here, which is actually at zero. It's a solid dot. It's not a dot itself, but the line counts as a solid dot. It goes up both these ways, and then it, it, stop, it would continue all the way up here. So even though there's a break in the graph over here, these values on the left overtake that, and so it doesn't matter either of those other points because this one side is increasing. So if any part of my graph has points, it counts for the whole thing. So my range is from zero, oops, sorry, with a bracket, because it includes it, and it goes to positive infinity. Now let's talk increasing, decreasing behavior. So I'm gonna go left to right, just to make it easy. This first swoop down, so let's do increasing, decreasing, and constant. That first one is actually decreasing. It starts over here, it comes down to this point, and that's where it changes directions. So decreasing from negative infinity up to the x value there where it changes direction, which is zero. And increasing and decreasing always get parentheses because points can't be increasing, decreasing. Then the graph continues in this motion, which would be increasing from zero to this point here, which this is two over here, which means this is one. So from zero to one, it's increasing. And although, remember, this is a solid dot, a point can't be increasing, which means it gets the parentheses. Then I come up here to this little segment, and that would be constant, one to two. And they are, this one's an open dot, so it would have always got the parentheses. This is a solid dot. If your graph stops on a solid dot, you can use, on a constant, sorry, with a solid dot, you can use a bracket. But because this same point is both constant and increasing, which is the next segment, that too gets a parentheses. And then we go back to increasing, which would be from two to positive infinity. Again, this would be arrows. So it would continue to increase. Okay, let's try this last one. So B, domain starts with an arrow on the left, stops here, but picks up here, stops here, but picks up here, and then points to the arrow on the right negative infinity to positive infinity. Now range starts with a constant line and there's a break in my graph here. So the first value I have is actually negative two and that would be a bracket, negative two, it includes negative two, then it stops from negative two to zero. It starts again at zero and both these arrows point up which means it's gonna go from zero to positive infinity. Now the one on the right is an open dot, here's an open dot, but this would count as a solid dot, so that's why that zero gets a bracket. Now let's do increasing, decreasing, and constant. Let me clear this off, oops. So this first part would be decreasing. It's falling as I move from left to right. So it's decreasing from negative infinity to that point, which is zero. Then it's constant from here to here. That's an open dot, so it gets a parentheses. From zero to four, and that would be a solid dot here, but this one is also at four, so it can't be both constant and, again, now increasing. from four to positive infinity. So your interval notation is gonna be entered in on your graph. Think about that it's gonna be short answer. Anything that's got an infinity is gonna say the word infinity. There will be no spaces. And um, in between the, like if it happens more than once here, you can put a comma or you can just leave it without the, without the space and both of them will get marked right. Just be really careful with your brackets and your parentheses. Okay, so then I put two, two, um, two, four, and two, five together because it was the parent functions and then the transformations and the piecewise functions. So we're going to kind of practice all that graphing together. 
So some of these um, questions might just ask you to describe the graph, what happens with the shifts or the domain or the range of those graphs. And then um, some of them are gonna ask you to ask you to actually physically graph it. So we'll give you the answer sheet if you wanna print that ahead of time so that it's helpful to have the graph printed ahead of time. If you don't have a printer at home, then just try to model a plain piece of paper like your answer sheet or like the example answer sheet. So let's go through the parent functions first. Remember that a x squared is a parabola with a coordinate point at zero, zero. The absolute value is a v with its vertex at zero, zero. The square root is half that parabola turned on its side. It's kind of like a little bit of an arc at zero, zero, pointing to the right. X cubed is a parabola with the left side pointing down. So one side up and one side down again, passing through zero, zero. And a cubic function goes above to the right of the y-axis and below to the left of an x-axis. So it's like a square root function pointing to the right and to the left. So now let's talk transformations. And I wrote this on a square function, like a, a parabola, but it works on all of them. The plus or minus on the front is going to be if it's pointing up or if it's upside down. So if it's positive, up. If it's negative, upside down. Then the number next to the actual variable itself or to the parentheses tells you how narrow or wide to make it. So if it's a number that's bigger than one, it's gonna make it increase faster or decrease faster. So you would, it would, you would plug a point in to see how fast it goes. And if it's a fraction, it's gonna flatten it out. The plus or minus inside the parentheses or next to the variable itself is gonna flip it over the y-axis. So if it's a parabola, unless it has a horizontal shift, you're not gonna see a difference or absolute value. Um, but if you have a square root, it's gonna actually point it left. If you have a cube root, it's gonna flip it upside down. And if you have an, uh, a square root of x, it's also gonna flip it the other way. I mean, sorry, a, a cube root of x. The plus or the minus number inside the function, so inside the parentheses, underneath the square root or in between the absolute value bars, and this moves left or right. If it's positive, it moves left, and if it's negative, it moves right. And the last part is the number that gets added or subtracted. Sometimes it's at the end, sometimes it's at the beginning, but if it's separated with a plus or minus, this is your vertical shift. If it's positive, it moves up, and if it's negative, it moves down. All right, so let's practice some of these. The test is gonna ask you to identify your parent function, describe the shifts, and then actually plot your new graph. So because this is squared, this is a parabola or a quadratic function. The minus three inside says to move this to the right three, the plus four on the outside says up four. So I'm gonna to go to my graph, I'm gonna to go to the right three, I'm gonna go up four and plot my vertex, and then I'm gonna draw my parabola. Now I need a couple of exact points. I need this exact point here, and then I need the point to the right and to the left of it. So because I'm at three, I'm gonna plug in two, two minus three squared plus four, negative one squared plus four, one plus four, which is five. So I wanna plot two five and then plug in four, four minus three squared plus four, one squared plus four, which is also five. And my parabola should be symmetric, so this makes sense. Now let's talk domain and range. Domain on this parabola, my arrows point left and right, so it's negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range, the lowest y is four, and then it points to positive infinity. Looking at the next one, I've got an absolute value. So this is absolute value or a V. The negative on the front flips it upside down. The plus one inside goes left one. The minus three says down three. So I'm gonna go left one. I'm gonna go down three and plot my point. And I know I'm gonna point this upside down so it's gonna look something like this, but I wanna plug in some exact points. So left and right of that point would be a negative two and a positive zero. 
negative negative 2 plus 1 minus 3 would be negative negative 1 minus 3 the absolute value of negative 1 is 1 negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4 plug in 0 negative 0 plus 1 absolute value of 0 plus 1 minus 3 negative absolute value of 1 minus 3 negative 1 minus 3 which is also negative 4 this is symmetric so this should make sense your V looks something like that. This time, domain again, negative infinity to positive infinity. Range this time goes from negative infinity up to negative three with a bracket on that negative three because that's the highest Y value. All right, F of X equals three times the square root of negative X minus one. So this is our square root function. The three on the front is going to make this taller. It's gonna, it's gonna stretch it vertically. The negative underneath is gonna point it left over the y, over the y axis, and the minus one is gonna shift it down one. So I'm gonna shift down one, and I know I'm pointing up and to the left, but I need, again, some exact points there. So I'm gonna plug in the points that are left of negative one, I mean of, of zero, so I'm gonna plug in negative 1 and I'm going to skip to negative 4 because that's going to be my next perfect square. So 3 times the square root of negative negative 1 minus 1 is 3 times the square root of 1 minus 1, 3 times 1 minus 1, 3 minus 1 which is 2. So I've got negative 1, 2. I'll erase this. And then I'm going to plug in 4, negative 4, square root of negative, negative 4, minus 1, 3, square root of 4, minus 1, 3, times 2, minus 1, 6, minus 1, which is 5. Negative 4, 5. So we knew it was going to point left, and we knew it was going to be stretched. And there's my exact graph. My domain this time goes from negative infinity up to 0, with a bracket on the 0. And my range goes from negative 1 to positive infinity. So although it's pointing left, it is pointing up. Okay, then we get to this last one. So the cube function. And that's my little squiggle that looks like this. The 2 is going to stretch it. The minus 1 inside says right 1. So I'm going to go to the right one. I'm going to plot my point. And I know it's going to go something like this. But again, I need some exact points to the right and the left of that one. So I'm going to plug in 0 and 2. 2, 0, minus 1 cubed. 2, negative 1 cubed. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1. And that's negative 2. And then plug in 2. 2, 2, minus 1 cubed. 2 times 1 cubed is 2 times 1, which is 2. And then connect my points. And here, the domain is negative infinity to positive infinity, and the range is also negative infinity to positive infinity. There's no restriction on either of those. Okay, last section is your piecewise graphs. So again, this would be on the part that's going to be on your answer sheet. It's actually one of the first couple questions, so you can kind of mentally prepare yourself. It's going to come at the beginning. You can always skip it and go back to it if you need to. But we're going to take these graphs and we're going to break them into the two little parts that they're in. So the first thing we're going to do is graph this first one. This is a line. So I'm just going to graph and erase the lines. Y equals 2X plus 1 says I'm going to go start at positive 1 and then go up 2 into the right one or down 2 into the left one. And I would graph my line like this. Now it says less than zero. So I only want to keep the values where x is at zero or left of zero. And it's less than, not less than, or equal to, which means I'm going to give it an open dot. So I'm going to go back and give that an open dot and point my graph to the left. Then comes x squared minus 4. This is my parabola. So I, I now know because of the parent functions, I have to go down a negative 4, and I would plot a point. 
And then I want to plug in some points to the right to make sure my graph is exact. So I'm going to plug in both 1 and 2. So 1 squared minus 4, 1 minus 4 is negative 3. That would be here. And I'm going to plug in 2, 2 squared minus 4, 4 minus 4, that's 0. So I know it's a parabola. I know my graph's going to continue on in that direction. And again, that was greater than or equal to. That's why that one started with a solid dot. Go to the second one. Again, we're going to do it in the two parts. This time they are both. Um, neither of them are lined. So we're going to look at the first one, x cubed. We know our x cubed graph is that little squiggle. It's going to pass through 0, 0, and it's going to look something like this. Now this is where it's less than or equal to 0. So I don't want anything to the right. And I'm going to plug in points to the left so I know exactly where that goes. So I'm going to plug in negative 1. Negative 1 to the third would be negative 1. So negative 1, negative 1. I'm going to plug in negative 2. Negative 2 to the third would be negative 8. So I know that part of my graph goes like that. Then I do the next part, square root of x plus 1. Now I know this is a shift up 1, and it would point to the right. This has to be an open dot here. And then I'm going to plug in again, point, so that that's exact. So I'm going to plug in 1, and then I'm going to skip to 4 because that's the next perfect square. Square root of 1 plus 1 would be 1 plus 1, which is 2. 1, 2 is there. Square root of 4 plus 1 is 2 plus 1, which is 3. 4, 3. And my graph looks like that. Okay, last one, f of x equals negative 2, absolute value of x plus 1, where x is less than negative 1, and then cube root of x minus 1, where x is greater than or equal to negative 1. So I'm going to do this one first. This is my absolute value. This means upside down. This means stretched. This means left one. So let's just draw that approximation. Left one upside down and stretch is going to look something like this. This is less than negative 1, which means there has to be an open dot. So I'm going to erase everything to the right of it. There needs to be an open dot on negative 1. And I'm going to start plotting some points like negative 2, negative 3. So negative 2 times negative 2 plus 1 inside the absolute value becomes negative 2, absolute value of negative 1. Negative 2 times absolute value of negative 1, which is positive 1. And then I get negative 2. So negative 2, negative 2. Then I'm going to plug in negative 3. Negative 2, absolute value of negative 3 plus 1. Negative 2, this is negative 2 inside the absolute value. Negative 2 times 2, negative 4. Negative 3, negative 4. And I know it's going to be a V, so it looks something like that. Then I go to the next one, the cube root of x minus 1. This is a cube root, so this is the one that looks like this and this. The minus 1 shifts it down 1. So I would go to negative 1. It would normally get it. This is going to get a solid dot because it's here. So actually, solid dot up like that, right? But i got to stop it where it's greater than or equal to negative 1. So I actually have to plug in that negative 1 to see exactly where that's going. Erase my original, or my approximation. I know I have this point at least. Plug in negative 1, 3 squared. The cube root of negative 1 minus 1 would be negative 1 minus 1, which is negative 2. That gets a solid dot. And then plug in positive 1. Cube root of 1 minus 1 is 1 minus 1, which is 0. There. And I know that normally it's going this way and this way, so my curve just happens a little bit on the bottom. There's some examples of your piecewise functions. So good luck on working on the review. Remember that your test is not going to have, um, you can't use a calculator on it. So make sure you're practicing without it and you're also going to have it on lockdown. So just prepare yourself to um, make sure you start there. Have a great day.